Hi, everybody. Hope you're having an amazing day. Thanks for joining us today for this live stream. Uh, my name is Radek. I am a customer success consultant and teacher trainer from Poland. Uh, and I'll be your host for the next 60 minutes or so. We have got special guest today, um, Christina. Hello. Hello. And also we are being joined by Pilar and Merv. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, lovely to have um, everyone connected. Um, I just I was planning to ask you a question where you were joining us from, but you started answering the question before I asked actually <laughs> asked it. Um, so what's the weather like there? In Poland, it's about 23 degrees Celsius now. A bit cloudy, but it's okay because we had a couple of really hot days reaching 35 degrees. Not a typical situation for this part of the world. So I can see people from uh, Italy, from Japan. Hello. 36 degrees. See, so it's oh, just wow. like in Poland. <laughs> That's amazing. The Philippines. Hello from Ukraine. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for joining us. Mexico. Sunny um, in Piemonte, Italy. Sunny actually boiling. Okay. Really hot. Nice. Glorious in the UK. That's yes, nice. I can witness that. Really <laughs> lovely day today. Oh, Egypt. I wonder what the temperature in Egypt is. Is it around 40? Maybe not. Argentina, hello. Okay. Oh man, 30 degree at night. Not a very uh, comfortable situation to relax and have a rest. Okay, so we're here today to talk about English file, American English file and uh, digital tools that will motivate your students and make your lessons even more engaging. Um, this live stream is based on your questions. We've asked you to send them in before, and today we'll try to answer these questions. But you're welcome to uh, ask questions right here, right now. We'd like this live stream to be as um, interactive as possible, and I promise we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Um, okay, um, so let me start with the first question, which is actually part of my teaching experience, because I've always believed English file has been the, the best course, hands down. It's just sheer magic. Um, so, Christina, a question for you. Why do you think English file is so irresistible? What's the secret? I really like the word irresistible. It makes me think of chocolate or uh, all sorts of things, but not really necessarily English file. But I'm glad that you had, or that people feel that it's like that. I think that there are two things about English file that um, that maybe make it appeal to teachers and to students and uh, that make it in some ways different from other courses, particularly at the time. Um, I think the first one is that uh, Clive and I, Clive was my co-author when we started, um, we were always teachers. We never got promoted. We never got promoted to director of studies or a uh, senior teacher. We were just teachers. Which is uh, good for us, yes. Well, yeah. and we loved it. We, we didn't really want to become administrators. We wanted to be in the classroom. And so we spent years and years just teaching. We were friends. We used to teach sometimes in the classroom next door to each other. And sometimes I'd go into his class and ask him something and he'd come into my class. So we, we had this uh, relationship as teachers and also the hours and hours and hours that we taught because between us, we taught for at least 20 years uh, or more just in the classroom. So I think one thing is that um, that as we were, when we started writing, we were teaching and we were teaching and using material from English file, um, piloting it ourselves, so that we really did have a lot of experience. And even now, where I haven't, um, due to my advanced age, I haven't been in the classroom for a while, uh, 
it was such a long time and so many years that I think even when I'm writing now, I can feel what it would be like to be in the classroom and using the material. So I think that's one thing. And then another thing that I think made us different from other authors um, was that uh, most of our teaching experience was always abroad in monolingual classrooms. So we had, we were faced with um, groups of people for, who had, uh, who spoke the same language, for whom it was much easier to communicate in their own language. And not only the language, often we'd have a class of people who were all doing the same thing. So all teenagers at school together or all working in the same field. And what we found was that an awful lot of the material that we were had to use, the books we were using, would have worked very well in a multilingual class where everybody had different experiences and where a question like, what do you do in your free time, would be sort of interesting to hear the answer. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Spain or in other countries where we were teaching, it, they were all doing the same thing. And so it really made us work. Our absolute aim was to create a course where um, we could get students to talk um, because the questions themselves, the speaking activities would be motivating and would be interesting. And it was great for us when the tagline for English File became getting students to talk or getting students talking mm -hmm. or something like that, because that was exactly what we'd always planned to do. And we had found that a lot of authors were based in the UK and their experience was mainly in the UK. And we think that that's why the material wasn't working for us. Mm -hmm. And as so many teachers are teaching abroad, the vast majority, hopefully, um, that makes it work for them. We've got a very nice comment from Dorothy. Uh, she says, I've been teaching with American English 5 for five years and still engaging to other levels and classes beyond adult classes. I appreciate your work. Yes. Yeah. I think this is a very nice Thank comment. And from my teaching experience, I can tell you that this is what my students appreciated as well. Um, once I met, um, before I, I started using English File, I met a student in the streets one day accidentally and he uh, was talking to me about his trip to London and kind of complaining that the language I taught him before he went to London was completely from a different planet because he couldn't even talk to the taxi driver. They just couldn't communicate. But English File had these uh, real English examples and that was very, very appreciated by, by my students. Okay. Although they still, I mean, people still complain about that, Radek, because really? obviously, they're, particularly in London, there's such a vast variety of accents and pronunciations that you can never, particularly at lower levels, you can't expose students to all of them. Yeah, I think in, in England, it's even more than in Great Britain, it's even more than in the United States, which is quite, quite interesting, because these two countries are different in size, but not in the number of different accents, right? No, okay, I, I, just, I just wanted to ask you one more question, which I just re uh, remembered, um, because you know, one of the most characteristic uh, features of English File, in my opinion, is that it's got a very, uh, how should I put it, it's got a very interesting, varied structure, like every lesson or every unit is a bit different, and the exercises are a bit, a bit different, um, so I imagine that the, uh, the reason why you did this this way was just to keep uh, students interested and be surprised uh, every single lesson brought something new. Was that what you were thinking about? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting because um, the publishers and the editors in the beginning didn't want us to do that. They said, no, 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 no. It's got to start with vocabulary and then this and then that. And we felt that every lesson was its own creature and, it, uh, and that the material would work better in different ways. And so at the beginning, doing it like that um, wasn't something that, uh, that the editor, editors thought people wanted. And they said it would be confusing. And then uh, particularly with English file, with all the material at the back of the book, um, we had lots of criticisms. No, 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 it's too complicated and they have to go at different times. But we always felt that uh, it would sort of keep students awake in class if they had to be doing different exactly, things. Yes. And if they couldn't predict the order. Exactly. So, That's very important because we were just recently talking about that, right? Christine and Radek in the Merv, about how important it is to have students interested and how easily they get 
distracted. So that that is one thing that I really appreciate about English file as well. It was the same thing where, for the same reason, we always wanted to have a bit of, we didn't want to have one really long reading lesson or one really long writing lesson. We wanted to have a variety of skills in every lesson because, again, it's something that's sort of natural anyway, that you might be speaking and listening and reading sort of within the same uh, within the same period, but also that helps to keep students motivated if they're moving from one skill to another. Or integrating that's true, that's true and you know sometimes i i remember getting these questions uh, from my students what surprise will you show us today what surprising stuff have you prepared not me english fine and did this for me <laughs> um okay uh let me have a look at, um, at the questions well there's a very nice comment from melissa um i began using the very first english file 20 years ago i still use some of those lessons enjoying the new edition too so it's if you can use a course book for 20 years that that means a lot, I guess. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so let me move on to question number two that we have for today. And the question is, um, how can we give... Uh, no, 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 sorry, a mistake. Question number three was that. Number two, how can I do more meaningful and pragmatic practices with the pronunciation sections? And I believe Pilar can answer that question. Yes, thank you very much, Radek. Yes, in fact, we have a digital solution for that very specific question. We have a variety of engaging activities in the LMS or the online practice of English file. And let me show you two examples of that in the online practice. We have this pronunciation exercise here. And well, what it is amazing a bit about this is that it is a clear conversation. So they will practice a conversation in little pieces. They will record their voices. And they can compare what they have said to the real audio. And after that, if they don't feel confident about their pronunciation, well, they can record it, record it again. And then they listen and they can do that again and again. And this is a conversation. They are not just isolated sentences. They are conversations that they can be practicing until they feel more confident about that. Or why not having them practicing a real interaction with a video? They can watch the video, videos in practical English. We were talking about this need from students to be facing real life conversations, such as checking in. If you want your students to be ready to check in, well, they can watch the video, trying to understand the context, trying to pick up some language needed to check in. And after that, and what is amazing, why not having them interacting with the characters of the video? Then they watch the video, but now they will include their voice. They will record themselves interacting with the characters of the video in real in a real life context, such as this one. So we have this guy trying to check in and there is where they can include their voices. They can record themselves, then they can stop the recording, they can listen, review and record again and again as many, as many times as they need it. What do you think about this, Christina? Is this helpful? I think it's fantastic to have a lot of pronunciation practice online because with pronunciation, uh, one of the aspects of active pronunciation, that's students practicing their own pronunciation, is that there's such a variety. I mean, just looking at where all the teachers are coming from today, for example, it's very dif difficult in a global course to address the needs of every uh, nationality and so that often some uh, and then even within a class uh, some students are going to have a better ear for pronunciation maybe they've traveled more maybe they listen to and watch more English online and so the pronunciation needs often vary and in that sense giving students the opportunity to practice online to practice on their own is really useful and also I think students sometimes feel embarrassed about how difficult they find uh, certain sounds to make 
Um, mm -hmm. I remember when I was learning Polish, for example, well, when I was teaching, I was always saying to students, for example, uh, how is it possible that you can't hear the difference between a and a? Because to me, they sound so different. But then when I was learning Polish, the teacher was saying exactly the same thing to me, that there's two kinds of shows. And for me, they sounded identical. And so I needed to go away and practice that on my own because maybe in a class, other students would have found it obvious. So that I think that uh, doing it online is something where, you know, students are all aware how necessary pronunciation is, but doing it online allows them to have the opportunity and the activities that you showed, for example, you know, being able to record yourself, compare it, do it again, really gives them the opportunity for that. Yeah, and then, the privacy so, of the room, which is also quite important, I think, because they, they can... Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Christina, because yeah. I've got a very interesting question about what you're just talking about. So ex this is from Halo, um, experiences in Africa. I've been teaching for more than 10 years, but still, as a teacher, doubt my pronunciation. Why? A very difficult question to answer, I guess. I think that you're not really doubting your pronunciation. What you're aware of is that you have a different accent when you speak to the way that, let's say, perhaps the recordings that you've got, their pronunciation. Uh, and I think that you should never doubt your pronunciation because your pronunciation, if you've got to the level of being a teacher, your pronunciation will be totally comprehensible, which is the only thing that we're really aiming at, comprehensible um, pronunciation. I spend quite a lot of time in Africa myself. I go out there twice a year, and it is a fact that uh, the, for the, you know, at the beginning when I started, it took me a while to get used to the pronunciation. But as soon as I got used to it, it was completely clear and comprehensible. And I think yours is the same. You can't compare your pronunciation to what you get in uh, the received pronunciation that's in a book. Not only is that not what all native speakers pronounce, there are so many different accents in the UK. So I think it's a question of that your accent is different, but I'm sure your pronunciation is equally comprehensible. Yeah, as long as there's uh, the communication going, so I think it's okay. Sometimes um, I, I met some some students, teachers as well, uh, on my teaching way uh, experience, that they said that they were trying to get perfect. The, the perfection was their aim. I think that might be part of the problem, that perfection is somewhere, you know, I don't know, too far. What would you say to what would you say to, to students who who want to be perfect? Well, it's Do great. It? To have, it's great to have that as an aim. But um, you know, I lived in Spain for thirty five years, and when I got a ta and my Spanish is completely fluent. And when I used to get a taxi, the taxi driver would always say to me, "Are you on holiday?" And I'd say, "No, I live there." And he'd say, "How long have you lived there?" And I'd say, 20 years or thirty years." And he'd always say to me, how come you still got such a strong accent? Mm, okay. And uh, I, I think that to sound, if your aim is to sound completely like a native speaker, it's great because it's going to make you work on your pronunciation. But to be honest, it, you know, it seems to me like a slightly unnecessary aim. Why do you want to sound English? Yeah, and it's if frustrating. You're proud of your own nationality. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, so let me move on to uh, another question, which is somehow related to the pandemic. Um, how can we give new time allotment to the activities from English file? Because after the pandemic, I'm going so slowly through the units, students get tired, or they cannot follow the pace. Um, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, thank um, you, Radek. Uh, for that question, I'll try to answer and to give some a piece of, of advice. As teachers, we're trying to go to normal again. But what I think we should do is to use what we have learned during lockdown, continue implementing IDC in the lessons instead of having students as mere consumers of information, having them discovering, sharing, practicing, trying to understand how language happens in, in real life before they are actually with us in class. They have used, now they, they, they are used to using more digital resources and these new students are more keen on using technology. So having them discovering how grammar happens in real life, 
picking up vocabulary on their own when they are at home working with the online practice, then we allow us as teachers to cover the content from course books easier. And that would be also more meaningful for students. There is formal research that states that students would prefer that, seeking for information, discovering, sharing, and then learning or receiving instruction from in the classroom. And we have all of that in English file. We have a lot of uh, exercises or activities in the online practice that are 100% related to the content of the course book. And we have, and then the course book will give teachers a lot of activities to have students talking, right, uh, Christina? I mean, I completely understand that question. And I think that, um, and I think it's true. I think we're all sort of a bit slower or we take more time about things. I would say that, first of all, not to worry if you're going more slowly, because often when you go more slowly with a particular topic or with something that, that, that you're doing, you know, you don't necessarily need to do everything that's in the course book. Often there's more material than you can actually use. And I would say focus on doing in class the things that students really enjoy, speaking, which is for a lot of students, their main motivation in wanting to um, in wanting to learn English in the first place. I would tend to spend my time uh, on vocabulary, on speaking, on activities that you know they enjoy, like games or uh, or things like that, and allow them to do the listenings, the readings, even the grammar practice on their own online. Um, uh, using all the digital material that they've got available. But the more they enjoy what you're actually doing with them, the more motivated they'll be to act to do more study in their own time. So I think that I'd think of, um, I'd think of speaking of, uh, as being your number one priority when you're with them in the class and things that they enjoy. There are so many activities and games and uh, discussions that they probably will enjoy doing that focus on those and then you'll motivate them to do the other stuff in their own time. Mm. I, I'd like to come back for a second um, to pronunciation because we, we've got a very interesting question from Jasmine. Um, you mean comprehension is more important than pronunciation? Well, it's uh, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Well, the thing is that pronunciation is two things. We tend to think of pronunciation as what we call active pronunciation, meaning how you pronounce. So all the activities with the sound pictures, with listening and repeating, that's what we would call active pronunciation. But what we mustn't forget is that passive pronunciation is just as important. That's to say, understanding features of pronunciation which will allow for comprehension. And there are lots of aspects of pronunciation which at lower levels we teach uh, for understanding. Things like linking lots of words together. Um, that's not something that an elementary or pre-intermediate student is likely to do because they don't speak fast enough. But it's something that, and so it won't sound natural if they do it, but it's something that they need to focus on because it's going to help them to understand. So I think it's really important with pronunciation to remember that sometimes pronunciation is for speaking, but sometimes it is for listening or for comprehension, as you said, and that they're both equally important. Yeah, surprisingly, we've, we've got a lot of questions about pronunciation. There is one ch challenging one. Let's take on this challenge from Manuel. He says, Christina, I'm not fond of recording myself because trying to mock as a pre-exam tasks. I need someone to listen to me, so I'm working out with an accent only. Mm, I think, well, we, we could try first and handle the, this part about recording uh, ourselves. I can tell you from my experience that hearing your own voice when after it's been recorded, it's horrible. That's one of the things. Uh, I completely agree. And I never, ever watch a video of myself after it's finished. Never. But on the other hand, what you could do is you, if you're working with a teacher is you can record yourself uh, and possibly send that recording to your teacher without having to listen to it yourself and ask your teacher for some feedback and then maybe do it again and say, is this better? I mean, there are ways of doing it. However, I do understand that a lot of people hate hearing their own voices on recordings. However, you know, there's no question that it is a helpful um, strategy. 
But if you really don't want to, send it to or send it to a friend and ask them if they can understand what, what you're saying. I mean, that's another way of testing whether your pronunciation is comprehensible. Yeah. And that is a good idea, Christina. Well, just let me mention that using the online practice, teachers are able to listen to their students' recordings. And then in some activities, in the speak speaking activities specifically, in the online practice, they can give them some feedback. So that is amazing because the students yeah. can record themselves and then teachers will give them, or will uh, guide them with pronunciation, with a feedback. And then probably once they are in the classroom, they can give a, an overall feedback to the rest of the class. But thinking about what you have said, Christina, it is a great idea to use WhatsApp. There, is an, there are some activities yeah. that I yeah. have been using and suggesting to teachers. And then it is something like you said, like why, have, why should we be listening to them all of the time? Why not having them sending recordings to one each other th uh, via WhatsApp or through WhatsApp? And then just, just to let them know if they are able to understand one each other. And that would be probably less challenging for them. Because yeah, no, I think that's a same. great idea, Pilar. I mean, I absolutely agree. And I think that, you know, the test of your pronunciation is... Did anybody, did the person you sent the message to understand what you were saying? And if they did, you know, you've achieved what you wanted through your um, your practice there. Now, I think that's great. Okay, we have uh, another question, which is a little bit off the topic here, but um, I think it's it's very, very interesting. It's uh, from Saboj. Sorry, I, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name correctly. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm an English language teacher here in Bangladesh in rural areas. There are many problems in teaching language based on ELT practicality. I try to localize, I think, some materials, but don't get things so easy. Would you, uh, would you please have some practical ways in the context of rural areas? That's a very, very difficult question. I think it's, it's um, like a, a special interest language, like very specific. Um, any, any ideas, guys? I mean. I completely understand where he's coming from because I said I go to Africa quite a lot because I work with a school in Uganda and the issue of books and materials there is a really, I mean, it's a really big problem and they don't have, uh, and it's also in a rural area, so they don't have these materials. I think that um, one, the only thing I think I could say if it really is difficult I suppose it's a bit illegal, but I mean, photocopying <laughs> in some circumstances, although it is completely not the right thing to do, in, there are circumstances, particularly with the material that is photocopyable. And I think one thing you could do is to get a teacher's book or a teacher's guide, as I think they're now called, and use a lot of the photocopyable material in the book would work because that's something that we expanded when we started 20 years ago, as I was reminded by one of the teachers with uh, the first editions, we only had communicative photocopyable activities. But now we've got um, uh, speaking activities, vocabulary activities, um, all sorts of things at the back of the book, grammar practice. And that's something that you, uh, photocopying is much easier in rural areas. You know, it is something that you can do so that if you were able to get hold of one copy of a teacher's guide, you'd be able to use a lot of the photocopyable material from the back of the book. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I was thinking of another idea. Why not using an ebook? If you have an Oxford University Press ebook, you are able to download it uh, to your smartphone. Uh, you don't need to have a very expensive smartphone. That's true. And you can use it offline. And yeah. then you will have all the audios and videos uh, to show to your students. I mean, trying to work in, in a different blended learning environment, such as uh, why not using different stations and probably using your smartphone, there is a station with some students, a few of them can listen to the video, answer some activities while others are working on grammar and others are working on vocabulary. And then you shift them again and just using your smartphone, being offline, they can enjoy the video and audios and everything, and you are offline using ebooks from Oxford University Press. That's that can be a, a good idea. 
Yeah. No, that's a really good idea. We we, we really appreciate this this question because it's also a kind of opportunity for us as as a publisher, right? So th there is a, a niche for us. Okay, just one more question here. The, I I find it uh, um, very interesting um, from Itat. Should I practice English with partner high level or lower level? Because based on my experience, I have practiced with lower. My English is not improving. <laughs> I mean, that's a really difficult question because uh, as a teacher, I know that uh, when you're putting students in pairs, there are so many, uh, th there are often different levels within a, t within a class. The very good students don't like being put with people who are weaker than them. Um, I think that uh, although it is ideal if you're in a pair with a person uh, who's the same level as you, I think that you need to look at it uh, from what can I get out of it from working with a, a student who I think is lower level. Possibly one thing you could get out of it is explaining to that other student um, uh, things that he or she doesn't understand or problems that she's having. Sometimes when you explain something to someone else, it's that's when you really truly understand it yourself. And so that if you use the opportunity to sort of take the role of teacher with this other student, then you would probably be actually really assimilating the language yourself. And then also remember that language is a bit like like driving, I mean, it's also a physical activity that you've got to learn how to do. And that even if you're not getting as much response from the lower level student, the fact that you are saying the things um, and that you are actually speaking means that you're always going to be improving a bit. But I think take, try to take the role of explaining things to them in English. And you'll find that you're giving yourself extra practice and probably learning at the same time. That's a great idea. Um, I remember the saying, probably it's not um, true when it comes to uh, teaching and, and learning a language. And it goes like this. If you are the best or the most intelligent in the room, you are in the wrong room. Um, so you should look for, for some challenges. But probably in this case, this advice about becoming a teacher yourself uh, is, very, is very good. I, I remember this process going on in my, in my head when I started teaching English. Okay, we have a comment which will uh, smoothly take us to another question, and it's from Mexico, from Claudia. Claudia, I guess, um, yeah, from, from Mexico, okay. We come back to a hybrid version of courses. So we are emphasizing productive skills in the face-to-face -face lessons. The rest of the activities can be done on their own in an online environment. So what a coincidence, because the next question we got from you before this session is, do you intend to launch a platform with English files books available for students and teachers? And this is probably our response to the hybrid way of teaching. So Merva, exactly. what can you tell us about this? Uh, it's a great coincidence that we have a new launchpad that uh, will bring together every digital need uh, a student and a teacher should have uh, to enhance their learning and teaching experiences without um, by saving you multiple from multiple platforms or multiple login details. And I think it's a great opportunity uh, to show the short video that I've prepared for you uh, to see the death uh, of Oxford English Hub um, in a minute. Oxford English Hub is our new launchpad for learning, giving teachers and students access to all digital course materials in one place on any device. And it doesn't just bring together your course materials, but also gives teachers everything they need for every step of the teaching journey, so you can plan, teach, assign, track and assess from Oxford English Hub. Now let's take a look inside. Please note that I'll be using American English File 3rd edition as an example, but the experience will stay the same for English File 4th edition as well. When you sign into your account, you'll see all digital components belonging to your course after choosing your course under My Courses section. Your online practice and classroom presentation tools sit in course material all in one place. When you click on them, you'll be taken right to your component. 
Here, I am taken directly to online practice activities, for which you will be able to track your students' progress and where you can also access built-in Oxford Learner's Dictionaries and famous English file Soundbank. Now let's check Students' Book Classroom Presentation Tool. When you open it, you will be able to make use of all the interactive tools of our good old Oxford Learner's Bookshelf. And the best part, you can even switch between Students' Book and Workbook with one click. Within resources, you will find many useful extra contents such as PDF Teacher's Guide, photocopyable activities, student book and workbook audio, videos of the book, and workbook answer key, all available to download anytime you want. You can also switch between teacher and student view to see which resources are available for your students. And within tests, you can see end of course, entry, file, progress, and quick tests that you can download and share with your students for your assessment needs. Last but not least, our professional development offer is now built into Oxford English Hub as well. Under Resources, within Professional Development section, you'll find three focus papers relevant to the course you're teaching. And when you click on additional resources, you'll be taken to three relevant PD modules to complete in your own time and enhance your teaching. Would you want to try and see it for yourselves? If you are already using the digital components of English File 4th edition or American English File 3rd edition, you can already access your course on Oxford English Hub. You'll just need to go to OxfordEnglishHub.com and sign in with your Oxford ID. You are now signed into Oxford English Hub, where you can access your material in the My Courses area. And if you are new to English File Universe and want to experience it through Oxford English Hub, you can get a free 90 day trial today. Just scan the QR codes on the screen or click the links in the comments, fill out the forms and get your code in your mailbox. Follow the instructions in the mail, redeem your code and start exploring instantly. Hope you enjoy Oxford English Hub as much as we do. Thank you everyone for watching. Please don't forget to get your 90 day free trials by clicking the uh, links in the comments and please feel free to leave your questions in the comments and we'll do our best to uh, just come to them. Thank you, Radek. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, Oxford English Hub is just, um, it, it plays a very important role when it comes to motivating students because that's the kind of reality, uh, virtual reality that they're used to. And, and it's much, much easier to communicate with them when using this. A very nice comment from um, Anna. Uh, I've used American English File third edition with online students and it's wonderful. My students have all also enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, a question about digital materials from Monica. Uh, all the digital materials available for us teachers are very helpful and useful. Thanks a lot from, oh my goodness, I'm struggling with pronunciation. I'm sorry. It's the name. Thank you. Thank you. That I don't speak. That that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, so it wasn't really a question, but um, okay. Um, th there's, a, there's one I would like to, um, uh, to discuss. Um, from uh, Dr. Yasir Awan, um, and it's just keep jumping, sorry, I just lost, okay. Please guide how to deal uh, with the shyness and poor confidence of the students to activate participation. Who would like to take this question? <laughs> well, let me share something. I don't know if it is possible again to share my screen. I want to show you something that has been very useful for my students, at least when I when I using a uh, English a, a, with English file. When we go to practical English, of course, they are very shy to participate in to participate in the classroom. But but there is something very useful when they are practicing within English file. When they are practicing English with the online practice, they are going to be given some hints on how on the language they have to use. The problems with the students when they want to participate, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they want to participate, but sometimes they don't have the language they need. But 
a brilliant thing about the online practice is that they are going to be given with some extra information in those speaking activities and some writing activities with the language they need. So again, I will go back to my first and my main suggestion. Let's have them exploring beforehand. We don't have that much time to have them feel confident when we are in the when they are in the classroom. So if we give them extra time to practice in the uh, online, to record themselves, to study the different uh, grammar points, even when they are practicing grammar with the online practice, well, the grammar keys will be included there. And another brilliant thing is that audios are included. If they follow the instructions that there are there are they, there are they for them that they have to answer the exercises, then they check answers as they listen to the audios, and then they can go to the grammar bank to check why the, uh, those answers were right or wrong. Then they feel more confident and they would be more willing to participate in the class because they have been making mistakes on their own at home. And when they are in class, they feel more confident. What do you think about that, Christina or Marve? I mean, I think it's very interesting what you're saying, actually, because it was also true that a lot of people who are very shy um, do spend a lot of time online and prefer communicating sort of online and in a virtual environment than they do face to face. So that I think it is possible that the shy students would benefit a lot from using the online materials. The other thing I think is that, you know, I think sometimes we expect students to be more communicative than they really are. I mean, we are actually asking them to do something often in class. You know, when we ask them, what do you think about whatever? They've got to expose their opinions in front of maybe 20 other people. And quite often, apart from the fact that they've also got to do it in a foreign language, it is quite a risky thing. I think that it's quite understandable that a lot of students, particularly if you're talking to a whole class and asking them for their opinions, don't feel comfortable about doing it. I mean, that's why we get students to work in pairs, or it's one of the reasons why we get students to work in pairs or work in small groups, because it's quite a risky and it's quite a scary thing to have to say what you think, and particularly today in the current climate where you can be criticized for opinions so easily, to actually share an opinion is not something that everybody would feel comfortable with. So I think, yes, encouraging them to work in small groups and encouraging them very much to, to work online uh, is a very good thing to do. But I think that we've got to understand that there are people who are shy and just don't talk that much in their own language. And so we can't expect them to be suddenly very chatty and communicative in English. Yeah, that's true. And you, you've, you've just been, you've been talking about uh, one of the aspects, which is what to say. But I think in, in, in class, we're also dealing with the aspect how to say things. And Absolutely. I can share one of my ideas with you. This is what I did in my classes. I always praised my students for making a mistake. And I use this expression, what a wonderful mistake you've just made, because I can use it to explain something. If you were lucky not to make that mistake just by accident, we would never even talk about this, right? So one of my students even had this idea to have a, a competition, which was the, the most wonderful mistake ever, right? And we just put these mistakes on. And it was a kind of, you know, a situation when, um, students felt proud of making the most wonderful mistake, which was brilliant in itself, and it really worked. And I just made them made them speak more. Right? I think that's a great idea because that's really giving them the confidence to not feel bad about making mistakes, which making mistakes, which is something that, of course, all learners of a language do. Yeah, everyone makes mistakes, obviously. Okay, so um, how about asking? The last question, I'm just uh, watching the, the chat room. If we find some other questions, we will answer them. But there is one question we just left for the very end of the session, um, which is final question, final cue. What is your favorite lesson from English file? And if you don't mind, I'd like to answer that question first. Um, and this one, this, uh, this lesson I wanted to tell you about. Now, this book is, the course book is too far from me. I wanted to show it to you. But walking there so it's from new english file um and it was called um little brother 
I think, if I'm not mistaken. And it was about an android little boy that was a gift to uh, from from a mother to a son. And um, it, th this was one of the moments when in my class something magical happened because the, the very end, the, 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 the final scene of the story is so surprising that I swear we had like 30 minutes of silence uh, in the classroom after everyone understood how this story ended. I don't know if we can share the end of this story um, because this, this particular uh, text is not part of, uh, of the latest um, uh, edition of English File. And it's understandable because we, we know how, how it ends. So it's not, it's not fun anymore, but it was just like coming out of the cinema uh, after something amazing. And yeah, I will never forget this, um, this lesson. It's great to hear that, uh, Radek. And it, you know, for, for me as, as co-author of the series, it's so incredibly helpful getting all the feedback that we do get from teachers, because every time we write a new edition, lots of what we do and lots of the changes we make are all based on uh, teacher feedback. We spend, you know, we get at least 150 or 200 teachers going through the books and telling us what they like and what they don't like, the lessons they like and that they don't like and why. And that is very much a part of what uh, or it influences enormously what we change every time we do a new edition. But it's yes. funny that you say that uh, because I, I loved that story, but some people found it really spooky. So, again, there were sort of different opinions. Uh was a bit spooky but in a good it way was. it's true it's true but like everyone like it's not often the case that nobody can guess the end of the story and in that case nobody guessed that at least in this one lesson that that i did and i will never forget it because then i felt that's what i should be doing in my life i should be teaching probably from english file for the rest of my life <laughs> but it's interesting actually that there's a writer called ishiguru sorry that i'm going off the point a bit uh, but who's written a couple of uh, novels that are a bit like that and there was one that i read recently where i also didn't realize that the person was a robot until halfway into the book so that we we were we were ahead of the times uh, with exactly. that is that because that was from 2008 correct me if i'm wrong I but think i think so. that was the first yeah, exactly. And it was spooky because the, the mother actually could turn off her son. I guess some parents would like to have this option just to make them quiet. Okay, how about you? Would, um, do you have any favorite lessons? Well, in my uh, case, I want to talk about all the practical English lessons, all of them. I was learning English with English file. It was like more than 20 years ago. And then I use English file to teach English to my students. And I really enjoyed those practical English lessons. I, I think it was amazing to have two different characters with different accents, American English and British accents. And they are really meaningful for all the, the, the this course book. What can you tell us about that, Christina? How you came up with the idea of having these two characters? Well, it was partly because we thought that the material that we wanted to teach was pretty sort of boring, being in a restaurant, going, checking in in a hotel, and we wanted to make that language more fun. Uh, we also wanted, we were talking about pronunciation, to expose uh, students to an American accent and a British accent right from the beginning, because we felt that was so important, um, whichever part of the world you were learning in. And, uh, you know... Soap opera series are so important now, they're part of our lives. And another thing I'd say is that um, I've done many question and answer sessions uh, over the years. And the thing that I have had the most questions about by far is what's going to happen to Rob and Jenny? Was, <laughs> yeah. was it a happy marriage? What Did they have children? You know, all sorts of questions about Rob and Jenny. So it obviously was something that struck a chord with teachers. <laughs> Great, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, um, we have another question. Uh, I mean, uh, answers to the question about favorite lessons. Um, so Melissa uh, says, I love the Frenchman with the American tourists on the train for the first conditional uh, from the original English file. Uh, okay, all of these are original, I guess. <laughs> Christina? Uh, no, I'm, but I'm enjoying reading the answers to this, I must say. Uh, sometimes they remind me of things that we wrote ages ago. 
Uh, but I also love the Frenchman and the American tourist, although it might not be very politically correct nowadays. Sadly, okay. things have changed in that way, but it was funny. But mm. we probably wouldn't be allowed to, uh, to use it today, I feel. All right, and one more uh, English 5 third edition elementary, the story of the fortune teller um, is, is a great story. Yeah. Uh, no, I uh, I love that story, and uh, it was inspired. I'll just tell you by uh, a scene in the novel uh, Jane Eyre, where exactly that happens, and the main character disguises himself as a fortune teller. Mm. Um, but I'm glad that you like it. Okay. There is one more comment. I'm hesitating to read it because I'm not sure how to pronounce um, the name of the um, artist. But you, you will give me a hand, okay? So the question is, my favorite activity is in a quite old edition, the one about present continuous with the painting by Toulouse-Lautrec. Lautrec, okay. It, it let me create great lessons linking art and, and language. And that's another very important quality feature of, of English Fire that it's also, it gives some inspiration, right, for the teachers to develop their own activities. I'm very lucky that my elder sister has worked for many years at the National Gallery in London using art in education. And so uh, I got a lot of tips from her about exploiting art and pictures. And sometimes I use her as an expert when we have a lesson to do with art, as she knows a lot about it. Yeah. And we had a short conversation before this session about uh, art galleries, and there is some work for us to do. So encourage <laughs> more young people to um, to appreciate, um, yeah, paintings. But, but often learning a bit about the painting just completely changes the way you look at it and makes you feel differently about it. So it's nice when students. Uh, I think almost every level of English file, somewhere there's a painting in it. I know we've got a Frida Kahlo painting. We've got a we had a Goya painting in one level. Um, no, we've used a lot of paintings. It's something that we enjoy doing and think it's a great way of, of teaching. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so I think uh, it's time to wrap it up. Um, if you like this session, live session, please uh, make sure you like it. Perhaps you even loved it, so love it. And uh, please do share this session. If you know a teacher who might need this, just tag them in, in the comments uh, below. Uh, we want to make these sessions all about you. So that's why we appreciate um, your comments. And we would like to encourage you to uh, give us comments about this session and about what you would like to see in the future. Uh, make sure you're following us on social media so you don't miss any of the sessions uh, we've got coming up for you in the future. We are, we are at um, OUP ELT Global on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us. We had people from all over the world. Um, that was uh, quite exciting for us. I think you would agree. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to uh, thank, thank you, Christina, for joining us. This is like living my dream because I've always wanted to, to meet That's you. Fine. Yes. Um, thank you, Pilar. Thank you, Merva. And um, I, hope, I hope to see you again next time. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Well, first of all, to you three to, uh, for uh, giving me such an enjoyable conversation. And thank you so much to all the teachers. And please do carry on sending in your feedback. It really is important for us and helpful. Yes. Thank you, Christina. I'm really happy also to be uh, working with you and discussing with you. It was amazing. Also, my dream. <laughs> A great pleasure for me. So remember, dreams do happen. I mean, the, the, you can, the miracles, I would say, maybe not some dreams, but miracles do happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>